Hi everyone in cloud computing and welcome to episode 44 of the Cloud Computing Australia show with Brad Nelson and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Limpicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. This week we're excited to have back on the show as our special guest, Ron Batra. Ron is an executive architect, a technology innovator and strategist in IoT, cloud and digital transformation. In this week's show we are talking about Australia's energy sector has been propelled into the Internet of Things in part by state and territory mandates. Energy operators and utilities that want to make the most of IoT have to learn to think big and it's almost certain that they need to pursue some kind of cultural change. Hi Dave and Ron, a warm welcome to you both. It's exciting to have you both on the Australia show and welcome back Ron, it's great to have you back. Thank you, Brad. My pleasure. David, my pleasure. I look forward to a great discussion with you both. Yeah, it's great to be back, Brad. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. And look, firstly, I must apologize to both of you and obviously to our listeners or viewers. I have a bit of a cold at the moment, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of feeling it a little bit. So please, uh, please do bear with me. But anyway, uh, enough of my excuses. I'll make sure you guys do all the talking on this show anyway. Um, so a nice opening question would be to you, Dave, is uh, how will the IoT market grow in Australia, in your opinion? Yeah, I think this is a good use case that we're going to see worldwide. And I'm, I'm looking to get Ron's perspective on this as an IoT expert. I mean, going forward, you know, this is ab absolutely imperative that if you, we leverage the utility based systems out there, become very good at doing the remote device management, the data acquisition management, you know, just kind of getting very good at automating all the things that we used to do manually, you know, as it comes to delivering utilities, delivering, uh, you know, government services you know, things like that. So I kind of look at this as not only just an Australia, Australian case, but, you know, going forward, it's going to be, you know, the ability to kind of get around some of the cultural issues around adoption. And I run into this all the time, because you would think that uh, utility organizations, people who are generating power, you know, governmental services, you know, water, light, you know, uh, even data, data center monitoring, things like that would embrace IoT. But there is a tendency to be kind of a cultural barrier to kind of assuming that we can do things better using automated devices than having human beings show up each and every time. And it's funny in 2018, 2019, you still see it. Um, but it's something we kind of have to get over as a culture before we're able to get the technology in, in hold. So, Ron, I'd love to get your perspective on that. Um, I echo your perspective. Um, what I would like to also do is I would like to expand. So I believe that IoT is going to be beneficial in many ways in terms of automating processes, automating the connection between people and machines. I believe IoT is going to revolutionize the B2B2C model as well as the B2B models. Having said that, there has to be a solid revenue, a business case to make IoT happen because it's a combination of different technologies that have to be knit together. Sometimes it's not as easy as a client server and just writing a Java app and a server in the back. It's much, much more than that. Or a web app. So when I look at that, utilities is definitely one sector. I also feel that industrial IoT is an area which may be a superset of utilities, Dave, but industrial IoT is a place where there's enough capital out there and there's enough machinery that is very, very expensive, the turbines, the pumps, the grids, those kind of things, you know. And um, look at your home. I mean, yes, we have IoT everywhere. You can take your phone and rent a bike Actually, that's an IoT bike if you really look at it, right? This mm -hmm. is your edge, and I'm doing near-field communication with the bike all over Austin, and then I can drop the bike wherever I want to. So now those are those are smaller use cases, but serious, you know, jokes apart, I think the big money is going to be in industry, industrial IoT utilities, and I also believe telecommunications because telecommunications infrastructure was not necessarily IoT enabled, and that infrastructure is changing with the convergence of tech as well as edge computing. Yeah, you know, I was talking to uh, uh, one, of, one of my neighbors about, you know, some of the IoT stuff that's coming down with the electric companies that are local. They're going to be able to, you know, in essence, remotely manage, you know, furnaces and air conditioners and things like that and have them participate in power cycling you know, kinds of things. And, and, uh, and I've done that in an industrial way years ago. And it really doesn't affect everything, anything. And it has a tendency to kind of reduce the cost significantly and puts, you know, releases the burden on the grid. 
And you know, just by doing these intelligent things that really have no impact on humans, you're able to get you know a, a great degree of value that's able to come down the line from these devices. But it was funny. The reaction from my neighbor was that uh, he thought he was going to be spied upon. The big, you know, the man was going to look at his stuff, and you know, he was totally against it. And and uh, I I think we're still dealing with that culture. And you know, as I go out and talk to large companies and you know people that have a tremendous amount of value to move in this direction, the technology is not being developed. It's ready to go. We're able to ba basically put it into good use and start saving money today and making things more efficient and effective and certainly better for the employees and the users of the technology. But there just seems to be that uh, that uh, mountain that we can't seem to get over. What, what are your uh, your thoughts on that? Yes, those mountains, whether those mountains, I think technology has changed a lot. And I'll give an example. When I was with the firm Deloitte back in 2008, one of my projects we were looking at was smart meters for homes. And that was one of the, I would call an early early stage IoT applications. We could not find the last mile of communication easily available in those days in 2008. We didn't have low power networks. But above all, what caused smart meters and homes to not become mainstream was the fact that a consumer would not pay 20 to 30 bucks a month just to tell him the pie chart showing his water pump took so much, his swing pump motor took so much, refrigerator took so much, and lights took so much. How interesting is that? That data doesn't change between day one and day two. You only want to know if there's a trigger or there's an alert, right? So where I'm going with that is when you come back from the home and come to industry, wherever you have preventive maintenance, wherever you can have things which are done by a human filling out a form or going to a website, if the machine can fill out a website for you and do it to dispatch, now it's not automation, it's not taking the human out of the mix, but you've taken one drudgery step out of the way. So now you have a machine saying that, you know, my bearing is going to fail 500 hours. Look at your car, you know, you get an oil change sensor that tells you your oil is 10% due, right? And then you get an alert saying that, go get your oil change, right? If you're not driving a Tesla, which I don't for now. But, but my point is that when you look at preventive maintenance, look at, look at things like that, and you will see those, those are the ideal use cases. There is so much of that everywhere, all over the country all over the world, actually, that can be automated. So what are going to be the indicators that show, you know, IoT adoption is being mainstream? You know, when are we going to pass that uh, that chasm, so to, so to speak, and uh, when do we expect to, to occur? Is it going to be next year, the following year, two years, three years, four years? Well, I'm going to share a little story with you. Have you. There are two movies which I really like to quote when I talk about IoT. One is Tom Cruise's Minority Report. <laughs> And the other is, there was a TV show, actually, not a movie. Um, this was uh, called Person of Interest. It's about a machine that does algorithmic analysis, does facial recognition, and is able to do machine learning to predict when a bad event will occur. Now, that is mainstream. <laughs> that is mainstream of everything. But taking a step back, I think I consider, when everything is IoT enabled, I consider as common as HTTP, you know, Nobody today talks about HTTP, right? It is everywhere. The cloud is internet 3.0 or 2.0, right? And IoT could be internet 4.0 if you really look at it. So I, I consider it as pervasive where your refrigerator at home, you know, a filter needs to be changed. Yeah, it will tell you a lie, but you will have the option of sending an alert to Home Depot or Amazon saying, send me a filter because the refrigerator filter is gone and you can automatically set it to do that. So when those things are happening all around you, like 20 to 30 of your touch points, your car, your home, your office, your building automation system, your um, your lunch ordering system, your fitnesses, when those things are happen, happening to where, you know, like today, so smartphone is all pervasive, right? Nobody talks about not having a smartphone. If you have a flip phone, people look at you like, where did you come up from, right? So a smartphone is there everywhere in the world. So when IoT becomes that pervasive as a smartphone, I would consider that point. When is that point? I don't think it's that far away. I think that the way things are happening, I would think two to three years at the most. Okay, I'll hold you to that. We'll have you back on the show and see if it's uh, two to three years actually happen. Not will berate you. Okay, I didn't bet any money though, right? So, <laughs> so ultimately, you know, uh, 
let's get back to Australia. I mean, how do you think they're going to get around some of these cultural changes and these technological changes that need to be around? Specifically, also, we're dealing with a governmental agency, which kind of makes things even more complex. Uh, so what, you, what would your elevator advice be in a 30-second elevator ride as to what they can do to kind of uh, make these things uh, less, uh, less of an issue and uh, ways in which they can get people on board? So my, my elevated advice really would be that you're going to gain efficiency, you're going to lower cost, and you're going to automate things to make, make, make the entire ecosystem highly effective. So efficiency, high, cost, low, productivity gains, high. Those are the three things I would try to align, align with. Great. As I agree with that. Brad, do you have any questions? Yeah, Ron, thanks. It's great. It's been a great show, and sorry I've been sitting back listening. It's fascinating listening to you two talk about this. There was uh, going back to your um, the TV show you're talking about. Was it the Suspect? Uh, I forget the title. What was the title of it, Ron? Uh, Person of Interest. Person of Interest. That's it. So uh, it's funny because this has actually been put into real life uh, it, for the royal wedding. Uh, that took place in May this year for uh, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, where um, Sky uh, News partnered up with uh, AWS to use uh, IoT and machine learning to digitally scan everyone that was in the wedding or involved in the wedding in real time and be and doing checks on the individuals as well using, I think it was AWS Elemental, uh, their media live service or something like that. So everything was done in real time. So it's, it's, it's really quite phenomenal. I think this was one of the first events it was actually used on. So um, it, it's amazing how things have uh, progressed in that respect, isn't it, Ron? Yes, I think that service you're talking about is Amazon Recognition with a K, and that does facial recognition. Uh, I don't know how good it is, so I'm not commenting on uh, you know, and it will improve over the years. But yes, that is the thing. just go. You look at the camera, and it says good guy, bad guy. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, you in or not. I'm not sure how good it was because I think uh, I'm not sure if I'm correct by saying this, but David Beckham came up as a tennis player as opposed to a footballer, uh, and his and his wife came turned up as a singer. But obviously, that's impossible because she was a member of the Spice Girls. So I don't know what happened there. <laughs> oh, God. Are you, are you, uh, you know, so Ethan Hunt, right? When Tom Cruise and some of the Mission Impossible 3 series, right? When he puts on a mask and impersonates the prime minister of a country, I guess he could, he could pass the recognition, right? Unless there's a separate biometric sensor. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to, you know, get the show to digress into my sense of humor. Apologies for that. I think it's, I think it's some of this medication, uh, medication I'm on. But thank you guys for being part of the Australia show this week and talking about IoT. I really appreciate that. And uh, Ron, great to have you back on the show. Looking forward to a, another couple of shows with you today as well for the C-Suites and for the training show. Great to have you back. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And great to have you on the show as always, Dave. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And thanks, Ron, for coming on. Thank you, David. Uh, absolutely. And look, you know, if you're watching this on, on YouTube, that's great. Remember, we're all over social media. Ron's on social media uh, with Twitter, which is at Ron Batra. Uh, all the links will be down below as well. David's on Twitter at David Linthicum. I myself am on Twitter at Nelson underscore Hilliard. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, all the social media you can imagine. Uh, and yes, yeah, stay tuned for next week. Remember to like, subscribe, comment and channel on this channel. Sorry. And, uh, and click that notification bell as well. Until next week. Thanks for watching.